of the, uh, you know, the, the, the cave wall itself. And uh, for me, that's kind of uh, a metaphoric image because it represents, uh, you know, um, the importance of uh, this time and really the emergence into a time uh, of, of change, of transformation, because uh, we know that a lot of things are going on in the world, uh, and certainly a lot of things are going on here in New Mexico that uh, really are, are going to cause some major changes, you know, in our life, in a way, in our, our, our way of life, if, if you will. So uh, I use it kind of as a metaphor to, to represent that change. Uh, this is a slide I often use um, because I am a self-taught artist. And you can see the, the human eye or the eye. It's, this is entitled in the, in, the, in the native eye. And you can see this collage of uh, different uh, forms. Uh, you can see the eagle, the bear, the uh, hummingbird, the, the turtle, uh, the antelope, and uh, corn. And then the, the sun and the moon and the morning star. So all of these are, uh, it's, it's meant to be a kind of a tapestry and uh, representing essentially all of the forces of nature, uh, ourselves as human beings in, in connection to, in relationship to, and in interdependence upon uh, all of those forces, those plants and those animals uh, that are part of our life and that give us life. So again, uh, a lot of what I'm stating actually comes from Pueblo philosophy in terms of how, you be, how we look at the world, how we see the world, how we understand ourselves in the world. Uh, so many times, and in many of the stories that we have, we talk about uh, a pathway, or we, we talk about the whole notion of a journey through a storied landscape. Uh, so if you can remember that, that term, a journey through a storied landscape because uh, many things have happened here in New Mexico. There have been many generations of people in New Mexico. And, um, and you come to different kinds of sites and places where, where things have happened, where there has been history. And uh, those places become uh, places of memory because these are the kinds of stories that, that we have about the places in which we have lived, uh, the kinds of things and events that have happened there. And um, those stories remain in our memory, you know, in the, in the context of how we have journeyed uh, through this storied landscape, which is New Mexico. Um, so uh, I use the term uh, many times, uh, look to the mountain, look to the mountain. And it's a metaphor uh, that we use um, in my Pueblo, at least. And uh, it's, it's, it's not just... Uh, like physically looking to a mountain because you can always do that, but the idea that that mountains are, are watersheds, mountains give life, uh, they're the sources of, of, of uh, the acequias, they're the sources of um, the, the life of plants and animals that, that depend on water, and of course everything depends on water, uh, including ourselves. And so that storied landscape includes mountains, uh, particularly mountains that uh, have these very special watersheds. Uh, in Pueblo tradition, we, we um, bound our territory by a sacred mountain. So there's a sacred mountain to the east, a sacred mountain to the west, sacred mountain to the north, and a sacred mountain to the south. Uh, for myself as a Tewa person, uh, this, the, the, the eastern mountain is the Sandia, mountain. Uh, the uh, western mountain is called uh, Clara Peak or Santa Clara Peak. Uh, the um, uh, the, um, uh, the western mountain or the northern mountain rather is, uh, is another mountain, uh, Taos Mountain. And, uh, and I didn't make a mistake. The south mountain is Sandia, okay? <laughs> so that, that gives you those four directions. So it's basically uh, Sandia in the south, uh, Taos Mountain in the north. Uh, in the east, uh, it's, it's actually the, um, the, uh, the Baldi, the, the bald, um, uh, Santa Fe Baldi, yeah. And then the west is actually Clara Peak. So uh, this is the way that a lot of Native people have uh, 
bounded their territory by the, by the predominant uh, features. But in this case, all four are mountains. So these are the four sacred mountains that we recognize. Um, so the metaphor goes something like this. You know, in order to understand where you are, you have to know your past, your present, and, your, and have a sense for your future. And when you're, when, you're, when you're walking up to the top of a mountain, you know, you take a trail, and then you're on top of the mountain, and then from the mountain you can see, you know, other mountains, other valleys around you. Uh, so the trail that you take to come to the top of the mountain, if you look back on it, that's your, that's your past. Those, those are the memories, those are the, the ancestors, those are the kinds of, of, of trials and tribulations that you've taken to reach the top of the mountain. The top of the mountain itself is your present reality. You know, uh, how you exist in this time and this place. And then what you can see from to the top of the mountain around you is the possibilities of your future. So it's always past, present, and future that is considered in this way of thinking about the places in which we live. So uh, water is life, you know, and one of the key elements and key uh, metaphors that we use, because, uh, you know, all of those mountains uh, that, I, that I told you about are essentially mountains that give life, they give, they give forward the waters that we depend on, and they form uh, what we call the, the Rio Grande River, which is really the, the, great, uh, the great serpent, you know, as we call it, uh, that contains that life, contains that water. So this idea of water is life, water is essential, especially in the Southwest, is metaphorized, it's painted, it's arted, it's, song, song, it's sung, and it's also danced in a variety of different ways. And the reason for doing that is uh, for us to remember to remember why water is important and where water comes from. And the importance of our responsibility to continue that, uh, that uh, tradition, if you will, of uh, conserving water, of using water wisely, and understanding that uh, water is uh, scarce here in the Southwest. And without it, we won't survive. So that idea of water becomes a real important metaphor and in, in Native tradition and particularly na uh, Native Pueblo tradition. So this is one of our lakes. And then uh, Pernal Peak is, uh, is uh, called a mirror of our uh, selves, presents a mirror of ourselves. I like this particular photo because you can see this is the Abiquiu uh, Dam. And then you can see the, uh, the reflection of Pernal Peak. And if we had a better, it, this is a really vivid slide, so if we had better projection, we could really get, you could really see it. But I hope you see that, that mirror image, okay? And of course, Pernal Peak, you know, is, uh, is an important uh, landmark uh, up, up north. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a mountain that actually is almost pure obsidian. And you, this is where tribes, many tribes, actually came to collect uh, obsidian for arrowheads. So it's become uh, an icon, um, you know, for uh, many Native people that lived in uh, northern New Mexico. So reflecting on our past to build our future is the metaphor. And, and uh, you find that with many traditional peoples like Pueblos, that uh, that's, that's part of uh, the, the process that we engage in. And that's part of what we do, is reflect on our past to understand our future. It's like that looking back uh, on the trail that took us to the top of the mountain and having a sense of that history. But also understanding that there's a present reality that we have to deal with and that there are future visions and choices to be made as we move into the future, as we move into new landscapes, new journeys. So um, New Mexico has been populated, it's estimated anywhere from, uh, in some, in some um, uh, journals, uh, 15,000 years, in other journals, 10,000, in other journals, uh, 8,000. It just depends on who you're reading and how they're, they're doing their, their estimation. But w indigenous peoples have been here for a long, long time. The evidence, of course, is in Clovis, you know, in the Sandia Cave and many other places where you can find evidence of, of um, 
paleo Indian hunters because, um, and especially here in Las Vegas, this area here for 10,000 years or more has been a place for uh, hunting and, and where you find a lot of these paleo Indian hunting sites. And I, I bring that forward because this, uh, this represents um, this idea of uh, really how long uh, the history, particularly of Pueblo and peoples are in, in this area, how long we've lived here in various stages of, of our development as a people. Uh, it doesn't show it too clearly, but uh, the, the hunters are actually hunting with an adult adult uh, spear. They're hunting these um, long-horned buffalo that used to exist uh, here in New Mexico about 10,000 years and probably right here in the meadows. You, you would have uh, large herds of these, these kinds of bison uh, roaming uh, about 10,000 years ago. Next slide. So, you know, we have, um, we have a story in the land. Uh, that story is uh, depicted by this particular slide. Um, the first Pueblo communities were probably uh, extended family communities. Uh, you find ruins of these kinds of communities all throughout uh, New Mexico, Utah, uh, northern New Mexico, Utah, and, um, and Colorado. And uh, particularly situated in these uh, pinon, uh, uh, pinon juniper biomes. And uh, I don't know if, if you fly over northern New Mexico, and especially you know, in certain areas, you'll see large uh, pinon pine stands, and then there'll be large, uh, large uh, clearings, and then you'll, you'll see another uh, large pinon stand, and then another large clearing. For a long time, we thought those were just there, you know, those were just naturally formed, but actually, um, we know that uh, Pueblo and peoples of this time would regularly move, you know, throughout their landscape. Uh, to uh, be close to the seven-year cycle of pinon, but also to to, under, to to replenish the soils because they, they use dry land farming. And uh, also really so that they wouldn't make uh, too much of an impact on the lands in which they lived and depended on for their life. So, so there was a cycling of these communities at one time. And you can see evidence, you know, throughout the north northern New Mexico and even in this area of this, this happening. So uh, uh, those first clans, those families and communities really formed the basis of uh, many of the Pueblo, uh, Pueblo people that you, you find today. And uh, again, this, this was uh, the ways in which the basic structures were made. This was also uh, the time when uh, pottery was created uh, corn comes up from Mexico to be planted. The beans and squash, you know, also are domesticated. Turkeys are domesticated. And the people are sustaining themselves, you know, through the land, through gathering of plants, and through, um, you know, an understanding of their ecology to such an intimate degree that they were able to, you know, develop uh, a real life, <laughs> you know, uh, to sustain their life, you know, in this area for quite some time. So uh, as will happen with any society, there is an evolution, you know. So you also find evidence of how those small uh, Pueblo communities began to evolve into larger communities uh, like uh, Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon. So these were the large, you know, cities that you see and we still have evidence of. You can see that there's more people. Uh, as, as you get more people, uh, uh, you know, life becomes more complex, you know, uh, you have to go further and further to find your sources of water, you have to, uh, you have to plan, you know, your communities in such a way that, uh, that it allows for more people to live the, in that community. Um, and you have greater impact on your environments, okay, the environments in which you live. So certainly, Pueblo and peoples have moved through that stage and, and, and reflected that stage in, in their stories. And then, of course, we come to contemporary Pueblos like Taos Pueblo today, uh, which uh, we think is about at least one, uh, maybe even longer, 1,000 years of constant uh, habitation. 
in, in this particular structure, uh, which we call Taos Pueblo. Um, and uh, really, you can see that, that uh, although this is a contemporary you know, um, expression of, of, of a Pueblo community, uh, all of those other histories you know, uh, are combined in this, in this representation as well. So, you know, that, those first clans, and along with those, those first large cities of the Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon, and then now into the contemporary Pueblos. And so we know that, um, that there's an evolution. And so we have a story, and we call it sto the story of emergence, in which Puebloan peoples um, tell the, the mythic tale of their movement from one world to the next. And in each world, uh, the people are given certain instructions of how to live in that world and how to sustain themselves in that world. Uh, and uh, usually, uh, something happens, climate change or other kinds of things, and those worlds end. And the people have to, again, move. They have to go on, again, a journey to find another place. They emerge to another level of being, another level of sophistication. And this has been occurring uh, at least for four worlds, and we're now moving into the fifth world, as it is said. So, uh, so while those stories are sometimes called myth or fable, they actually really aren't, because a lot of them are actually based on, on real history. Uh, they're, just, they're just put into metaphoric form so people can remember it. They're put into story form so that people can remember to tell it in, in terms of telling the history of a people in a place through time and through generations. Now, this is really important when you're looking at sustainability because sustainability does require the ability of any society to be able to evolve, develop, and to do the kinds of things that are necessary that allow it to sustain itself in a place over time and generations. And so that's why I say that essentially uh, native traditions are extremely uh, uh, oriented to sustainability, uh, sustainability as we know it and as we understand it today. Next slide. So uh, in that journey, in that process, you know, uh, we develop relationships to plants and to animals and depict those relationships in the forms of art that are produced, such as this uh, Hamas canteen with the uh, heart, uh, with the heart arrow going through the through, through the deer uh, design, uh, and the understanding of the the importance of animals, the importance of having relationship with animals, and uh, because uh, native traditions began essentially as hunting traditions, you know this is this is one of the oldest kinds of. Uh, um, stories, okay, the oldest stories many times come from our relationships to these animals, uh, you know, as we hunted them at one time. And so this metaphor of seeking life uh, is embodied in many of the traditions, many of the stories that we have about hunting. And so this is um, a more contemporary uh, representation, a painting of probably the kind of hunting that used to go on in the, in the uh, early to mid 1800s, right here in Las Vegas, okay? Uh, as the different tribes met and actually had buffalo hunts in this area. So uh, the metaphor of seeking life is a very important metaphor to, to really think about because this is, a, this is a kind of an ethic and it's also an action uh, that requires you to think about what is it that gives you life, how do you perpetuate those things that give you life, and how do you participate in, in the life of a place, in the life of each other in the community. And so the metaphor of seeking life becomes a very important kind of metaphor to think about. Next slide. So uh, to remember uh, these very important ethics, if you will, uh, we have dances, and so I'm sure some of you may have seen buffalo dances that different Pueblos perform to commemorate their relationship to uh, the buffalo, which is a representation of really the whole animal family, but also uh, has a special place in the history of Pueblo and peoples as being uh, one of the sources of life, you know, that they had to seek, that they, have to, they had to find 
uh, through the process of hunting. So, uh, so many times, you know, the, the dances that we perform are, are um, mechanisms for remembering to remember these histories, these very important histories that we have. And this is true of other uh, tribes as well. Uh, because this, uh, for other tribes, dance has the same function. Song has the same function. Story has the same function of uh, keeping in the, in the people's memory those kinds of uh, entities, those kinds of dynamics that serve to give them and their community life and continue life, sustain life. So I use this term, uh, and I'm trying to read up here. Uh, so this is an indigenous community. Okay, so this notion of indigenous community is also important as a concept. So the, 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 the metaphor here is we are all kernels on the same corn cob. So this is a principle in, in uh, biology called unity in diversity. You can see that each one of the kernels of corn is, is, is going to be a unique corn plant. It it's, has a, a hue and, and, a, and a shape onto itself, so it's an individual. But it sits up against adjacent to and leans against other corn kernels on a corn cob. So the corn cob is the structure of the community. The corn kernels are the individuals within a community. But the, the, whole, the whole corn cob essentially is a representation of uh, this unity and diversity, that there is difference in each individual corn kernel, but there is a uh, unity in terms of the structure in which, uh, in which all the kernels lean against each other you know, to form the corn cob. So this idea of unity and diversity, which we talk about in biology in terms of, of also um, sustainability science, is uh, very much a part of the thinking of Puebloan peoples, you know, as, as, uh, as we look at this metaphor. So this metaphor is sung, it is arted, it is gathered, it is danced, uh, in all of those different kinds of contexts that we use corn, uh, we remember that we have a very special relationship to corn and that it is also something that gives us life. Next slide. So again, you know, uh, that representation is, is storied in the form of, uh, uh, let's say, the, the mother corn and her relationship to her children, which are the corn cobs, which represent human beings, you know, the first human beings. So uh, that first mother uh, is also a representation of the plant mother, is also a re representation of the earth mother. So there are a lot of different ways in which Native peoples, you know, represent their understandings of themselves in community and in relationship to a place. Uh, we also have techniques uh, that we've used, you know, and these, these are the technologies, you know. So all of the, this living process requires you to develop a kind of native science in which you develop technologies of sustainability. And so one of, the, one of the forms of sustainability is represented by this uh, Hopi uh, farmer uh, in Hopi country, and Hopis are also Pueblos. Uh, in Hopi country in Arizona, you'll find these lush um, cornfields in, in arroyos. <laughs> and you're wondering how in the world do they grow, you know, such lush fields in, uh, of corn, abundant fields of corn in these arroyos. Well, they've developed a corn plant that has, uh, where, whose roots go as far uh, down into the soil as, as the stem of the corn goes up into the air. And uh, because it has such a deep-rooted uh, system, uh, the, the roots actually um, go right into the clay layer because every arroyo has a layer of, of clay under it. And when the water rushes, you know, when we have uh, rainstorms, um, you know, uh, that, uh, of course, it goes right through the sand, percolates right through the sand and goes to that clay layer, and it stays there. The water stays there. And also the nutrients, you know, that are carried by the water stay there. And that's where the roots go. Uh, and that's why the plants are so lush. 
So, you know, we dance, uh, as I said, and you'll see these dances happening uh, when we start again and get out of the COVID uh, situation as we start doing our dances again. Uh, we dance every uh, stage of corn and its development from, its, from this time when it's getting the fields ready to uh, the time when we're harvesting corn. There are dances that are being performed by Pueblos to commemorate these special times of the corn and our relationship to the corn and our relationship to each other in the communities that we have. So, you know, uh, ultimately, what is this all about? Well, what is sustaining about? It's, it's, it's about um, the harvest, which is another metaphor for saying, seeking life, finding life, and having life, and celebrating it. So this takes us, you know, uh, uh, and all human cultures at one time had these kinds of ceremonies, these kinds of rituals, these kinds of, 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 of um, ways of um, recognizing their relationships to each other in community and also their relationships to the land, their relationships to the, plant, to the plants and animals and to the waters and to the weather that gave, gave them life. And so this is probably one of the most ancient forms of uh, science. Uh, this idea of how humans have sustained themselves through time and through generations in places. <clears throat> so, you know, this representation of uh, the harvest, you know, the, the fruits of the land, you know, uh, if you're a farmer, you know how, how much work it takes to get to this point. And it's a time of celebration. It's a time of coming together to to uh, remember to remember, you know, uh, how you got there, to remember to remember the stories, your history, your ancestors, all of the things that matter in the, this context. So, um, so this book, you know, explores from the standpoint of various authors, various authors of the chapters in this book, uh, this whole notion of uh, seeking life, uh, finding life, having life, and uh, native foods, native health, native community, native family, native art, uh, native teaching, and native learning. So these are some of the traditional foods uh, that uh, are part of the cuisine, if you will, of the of uh, the Southwest. You can see the the buffalo uh, gourd, um, uh, the buffalo gourd there. You can see the sunflower, the chilies, uh, the pinon, the cactus, the corn, the beans, uh, and the various forms and representations, uh, the cactus buds. All of these things are traditional foods here in the Southwest that have been used, you know, since time immemorial, but uh, nonetheless are part of uh, what I'll be talking about next, you know, with um, Pueblo plants. So let's go to the next. So uh, let's, yeah, this last one is very important. Uh, sustaining the land and the land sustains us. So that's a picture of uh, the Sandia. Uh, I think I took it from uh, near Santa Ana Pueblo, but uh, you can see this idea of metaphor that the land provides us with, uh, with all of the things that we need to, to sustain ourselves and to sustain life as a whole. And the connection of the mountain to the plants and to the landscape itself, I think, is self-evident, but it's a very important point. Now. Uh, I, I just, there's just a few more here. So, um, so this idea of food for life, because you know, we love to eat, everyone loves to eat, you know, and we have a very distinct cuisine, but um, food also has uh, a very deep meaning. Uh, in many ways, it's a sacrament because it actually is the foundation of our life. Uh, and uh, so that's why it's celebrated. And uh, this is why pottery many times are created to contain uh, that which holds your life, or that's what continues your life, which is food. Okay, so all of the different kinds of foods that we have uh, from this tradition and this view, you know, should have a container that is beautiful also that contains them. And so we have the whole tradition of pottery connected to food and to food traditions, you know, here in the Pueblos. Uh, so, you know, the 
the well, the fry bread is a new invention, but nonetheless, you know, an adaptation. Uh, but certainly, the the venison stew, uh, the chili, you know, the corn, the squash, the beans, all of these things are represented in this in this slide. So, celebrating uh, the life that we have been given, you know, celebrating uh, one of the the hallmarks of a good life is to actually live to an old age. <laughs> And uh, that's a representation of something having been succeeded, you know, in, in one's life and one's lifestyle. So elders, not only because they hold the stories, they hold the memories, but they also are a representation of, of that, that process of life and that process of seeking life and, and maintaining life. So uh, here are two grandmas, you know, Pueblo grandmas, you know, enjoying their, their beans and their... Um, Pozole and their chili. But that idea of celebrating life becomes an essential point. And that's really the point of celebration. And that's why food comes into every celebration in some shape or form. So the spirit of sustainability for me is the Cocopelli. The Cocopelli is the south, Southwest icon, means many things. But uh, for, for Pueblo people, uh, the Cocopelli is the... Um, the creative spirit within nature and also within us as human beings. And the special music uh, he uh, plays represents that, that, um, that music of life, you know, that uh, permeates. Uh, if you can hear it, you can actually even hear it in the wind, even though the wind is very strong, you can hear it as the wind moves, you know, through trees and through the landscape, uh, the whistling and the roaring. Uh, so all of those things are, are part of this, this way of thinking about and understanding our relationship to the places we live in and how we symbolize it in, in the form of Kokopelli plays his music, beckoning us on. Okay, so um, the next slide is just going to be uh, to cover some of the plants uh, of uh, Pueblo and peoples. Uh, lots in common uh, also with... Um, um, uh, Remedios de la Gente here in, in, the, in, in the north, you know, with regard to the similar uses of the same plants. Uh, some differences now and then, but actually mostly the same uses. So I'm going to go ahead and go uh, right into this. So in New Mexico, plants uh, for food and medicine. Uh, of course, you know, we're going to see the... Um, the various aspens uh, and cottonwoods, you know, start to start to leaf. Aspen and cottonwood is used uh, throughout the Southwest for a lot of things. You know, the, you can take the bark, and in earlier times, especially the the cottonwoods that grow by the by the river, by the Rio Grande, and uh, boil up the inner the inner uh, layer, um, and uh, they become uh, it becomes like a plaster. And in the old days, they were. This was used as a, with with cloth was used to um, wrap um, broken bones. Okay, so uh, if you if you soak cloth in the uh, boiled um, uh, underskin uh, of uh, any kind of cottonwood, uh, it'll produce a kind of um, very uh, almost like a, uh, mucus glue. And if you let that dry, it's going to dry hard. And that's the reason why it was used as a, um, you know, as a, you know, for splints and for, for broken bones. Uh, the, the, the bark it was used, certainly the bark can be used artistically. Uh, many uses for cottonwood, uh, carving, uh, you know, building. Um, uh, the leaves themselves can be boiled sometimes to make natural dyes, depending on what, what stage the leaf is in. Next slide. Uh, cottontail, which grows near water, and has a, it's a water plant, you know, have been used throughout the Americas, you know, as a source of um, a very highly nutritious grain. Uh, so the cattails were used, you know, as a food source. Uh, many times uh, they were given; it was given as a kind of cereal. It almost when 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 you cook it, it looks almost like quinoa, and. Um, it's, it was given to uh, people that were just recovering from an illness. And so it's a very highly nutritious uh, plant. The roots themselves uh, also have that, 
uh, nutritional quality. They're very much like car carrots, but um, you have to develop a taste for them. But then nonetheless, they're, they're, they're very, very nutritious. Next. And I, I think that's a pinion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm looking at it. Uh, well, here in the north, in, in, you know, here in New Mexico, the pinions have been, since Pueblo times, one of the staple foods, you know, and the pinions have a seven year cycle. So a certain, uh, a certain crop of pinions will appear in a certain place and they'll be abundant and the people will, will see that and will go pick it and then they, they, they won't flower really or have that abundance for another seven years. So there's a seven year cycle and the people learned how to follow uh, that cycle of uh, productive pinon trees, okay? And so that's why you see the patterns that you see sometimes um, uh, up north uh, around these large open pinon um, fields or fields large uh, field, uh, fields that are open and then large pinon stands and then another large uh, open uh, because people used to move around you know in in uh, the landscape following the pinon uh, the pinon is very nutritious of course it has uh, lots of fats and oils and uh, you can make bread you can make it into cereal you can eat it roasted uh, or you can uh, uh, put it with other foods, uh, include it with other foods. So lots of different uses. Of course, the pinyon wood itself is uh, avidly sought because it burns uh, hot and uh, it gives you a really good, um, if you're cooking food, it gives you a, it gives a really good taste to the food. Uh, because it's an evergreen, uh, the evergreen oils, you know, uh, allow you to, um, uh, if you have a cough or a cold or uh, the need the need to warm your what we call warming your stomach, uh, pinon needles are very excellent for that. Actually, any pine needle will do the same thing, but pinon needles in this area. Uh, this one is is um, not as available. You have to look for this one. This is called buckweed in uh, English. But it was um, a plant that was used for natural dyes. And um, it's, it's kind of also um, a cereal plant. You can actually uh, pick it and cook it like you would cook oatmeal and uh, add, some, um, uh, you know, add some of that cattail and you really have a good, uh, a good cereal going. So that's buck, uh, buckweed. Uh, the nodding onion, wild onions, okay, uh, you can find in many places, you know, uh, especially along uh, streams or, or in meadows. Um, really, really strong taste. Really good uh, to rub yourself if you want to keep the mosquitoes away and everyone else away too. Uh, but uh, in terms of soups, in terms of uh, putting with beans or eating with beans, uh, no greater flavor, you know, than, than the wild onion. And of course, the wild onion has lots of different vitamins and minerals within it. Uh, usually, depending on the soils in which it's growing, uh, you can find uh, wild onions that are, are uh, really, really nutritious. They have a lot of different uh, iron and minerals in them that uh, really allow you to, uh, sometimes was used as a blood uh, tonifier which means it was it enhanced your blood, you know, as, as you ate the wild onions. Um, so, um, and especially if you picked it from, from uh, high onion uh, or <laughs> high iron, uh, high iron uh, soils, you know, high in iron soils. So that was nodding onion. Uh, the Solomon seal, false Solomon seal. Uh, it's a beautiful plant. Uh, but uh, also used as a, um, what we call a, a, uh, a wound purifier, uh, used uh, to uh, both in its, its uh, fresh form, you know, squeezing the juice as well as in its boiled form uh, to uh, cleanse wounds. Uh, you can also eat false Solomon seal and, and um, it, very, it, it cooks up very much like spinach, okay? So, next one. 
This one, I think, did we see this one already? Okay, so the, this one is uh, probably an, another variation of that buck, uh, that buckthorn. So next slide. And of course, dock. Uh, dock is used, uh, the root is used uh, for, uh, you can see a lot of the, the naturally dyed textiles that were created. So dock gives you a really uh, deep yellow color. Uh, it's like a carrot, so it goes all the way down. Um, and uh, you can eat it. Uh, it sometimes becomes bitter depending on when you pick it. Uh, so uh, dock is, is uh, also very highly nutritious, very, very much a, a part of a salad that, uh, or can be a part of a salad that gives you a lot of nutrition. But it's really the root that was used, you know, extensively dried and, and, and uh, you know, ground into powder. And sometimes you could also make a kind of watercolor or paint from it. But again, DOC has a, has a, lot, of, um, a lot of uses here in the Southwest. Uh, goosefoot, very uh, particular plant because you can see it looks like, like a goose's foot, the leaf. Okay, uh, uh, another edible plant, highly nutritious, lots of vitamins and minerals. Uh, the Ermeth, you know, uh, was one of the, uh, along with Kenowa, uh, particularly in, in the South America, and really in Mexico, all the way through South America, was one of the key plants along with corn that really sustained those civilizations over long periods of time. And so Ermeth is, um, is one of those plants that has multiple uses. Again, it's, it's an edible plant. Uh, it can be used in, in salads, but Ermeth can also be used as a uh, treatment for... Um, what is called a, um, you know, when people are recovering from, uh, from a long illness, there are certain foods and certain tonics that are given uh, in, uh, that, that really help them, you know, to regain their vitality. And so uh, what you're going to find is that a lot of the uh, plants that are edible that have lots of vitamins, uh, usually long roots, because Aramith also has a long root similar to, uh, to some of these other plants. Uh, it, uh, it was often used you know, as, a, as a, um, a kind of tonic food source you know, for people recovering from illness. Uh, and th I think that's probably because it has so many vitamins and has so many uh, uses in that regard. It also has, as, as you can see, the top uh, that can also be gathered. They're little seeds, and you can grind them up and make bread from it, or you can make uh, flour from it uh, for use in a variety of different kinds of things, or you can make cereal from it. So those are all of the uses of Aramith. Uh This is called floor clock, and uh, floor clock has, has um, uh, another basic use that uh, aside from being uh, another edible uh, herb, uh, four o'clock can be used as um, uh, ground up. Uh, you know, uh, many times we get rashes, different kinds of rashes. And in the early days, that was, that was very common. And so people would find different kinds of plants and they would try them out on, on you know, rashes or sores or things like that. And so four o'clock is one is an emollient plant. It has uh, it has qualities to it that allow for uh, uh, skin rejuvenation uh, because it also has certain kinds of uh, uh, minerals and also vitamins in it that really uh, enhance the skin. And so this particular plant was used for that, as well as being eaten. Yes, uh, purslane. Um, a lot of people have purslane in their gardens and they're pulling them up like crazy, but uh, purslane, uh, I think the Spanish word for it is calites, right? You know, so that um, you can pick it, uh, cook it with onions and cook it with, um, you know, fr fry it up uh, or cook it, depending on what you want to do with it, but it's, it's really one of the staple 
uh, very much like spinach was is used, you know, and 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 was used as a side dish in for many of our our dishes, you know, traditional dishes. But I'm sure you've all seen purslane, and um, and how many have used that before? Have have cooked it? Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, that's one of those plants, you know, that is is so much a part of both Pueblo and and Hispanic culture here in the. Uh, here in New Mexico. Next. Okay, Western Tansy mustard, because actually mustard does come from this in the Western Tansy. Uh, mustard, you know, of course, uh, is 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 a condiment, uh, but in the early days, it was also used as a wound medicine because it has, um, uh, it, when you apply it to the skin, uh, it acts like a pepper would. It it numbs the uh, the nerves in the skin, and and many times was created as a as a, uh, a salve. Uh, for uh, alleviating pain, arthritis, and other kinds of things. Uh, it's also a natural dye. It also can be used as a natural paint because it has such a bra strong, bright yellow color. Uh, and so, again, wild tansy mustard, you know, um, was avidly gathered and used extensively here. Old Rocky Mountain bee plant, bee plant. Um, beautiful plant. And uh, you can smell this plant before you see it, <laughs> because when it is uh, when it is blooming, when it is out there, and usually this is in the high meadows and the high uh, fields uh, in the mountains, you can see it, or you can you can smell it before you see it. And um, the bee plant, because it has a, what's called a volatile oil in it, is uh, very similar to wild oregano. Okay, but the bee plant actually has such an aromatic um, odor to it, it does attract bees and other insects. You know? So this is another way that, that a lot of people recognized it uh, besides its, its, its odor. Uh, a lot of bees hang around it, you know? and so that's, that's why it call, it's called a bee plant. But again, uh, any of the uh, plants that have volatile oils are, can be used as cough medicines, as medicines for um, throat inflammation. Um, uh, you can even make a, a very small gruel and pull it, put it in your nose, almost like Vicks, and uh, it will help with uh, sinus inflammations. Okay. Uh, dove weed is a little bit harder to find. It's, it grows in very dry, alkaline soils. Okay. Uh, but doveweed was another, uh, particular uh, in its ground form, was used as a, as a wound dressing. Uh, it was also used to uh, alleviate some of the pains of arthritis. Okay, so doveweed. Next one. Globe mallow is another one of those highly nutritious, like aramith, globe mallow um, plants. And uh, you can find mallow almost every, there's several varieties of mallow. You can find them almost anywhere uh, in, the, in the pastures, you know, and places in New Mexico. But um, the mallow itself uh, was many times used uh, as, a, um, uh, as a very mild, um, you know, when you have gas and you have a, a lot of congestion after eating too much chili or having beans or, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, taking a, a small tea of mallow will help to calm your stomach, you know, especially if it's gurgling. <laughs> we have the, we, we, we know, all know that sensation, especially we eat a lot of chili or, or beans. And so this is one of the, the treatments, I guess you might say, for that condition. But what it does is it really, it really helps the, um, the digestion work properly. And so it, it really begins to help break down the foods and, and, and get rid of the gas and really soothes the lining of the stomach. And so many times that was what it was used for. Yeah. All prickly pear cactus, so many uses for cactus. You know, of course you can eat it. 
Uh, many times there was a glue that you could make from the, um, the sap. And uh, certainly the flower or uh, uh, the buds, especially as they're, as they're coming out, were used extensively for jams because it's very sweet, as you know, as, as, as a jelly, a jam. Uh, and when in dried form, if you sort of just rehydrate it, you know, you can still use it in a variety of different kinds of dishes. But high in vitamin C, as much as an orange, <laughs> or more sometimes, and, and, and uh, again, it used in so many different ways. Uh, the, the flowers are also a natural dye. So many times they were avidly collected and boiled up, you know, to, to, do, uh, to dye fabrics of various types, uh, but more particularly wools. Wild celery, of course, is very common and very tasty. And so I don't know if any of you had, you know, cook a pot of beans and put some wild celery in it, and it just, bang, it hits your, it hits your taste buds, you know, in, in some really, really amazing ways. And I'm, I'm surprised that it's not used much more than it is. It is hard to find, and of course, uh, I should say at this point that a lot of the plants I'm talking about, uh, some of them are actually endangered because our environment is changing so fast because of the drought conditions that we're facing. A lot of the kinds of plants, uh, I'm going to do something here uh, at Highlands um, in, uh, right after uh, Easter, the weekend after Easter, where we're going to try to look for some of these plants. But I was looking around and seeing that a lot of the plants are not around anymore. Uh, they're difficult to find, uh, first of all, because of the drought conditions, and I think also because a lot of herbs and a lot of plants have been discovered, uh, there's been overpicking of a lot of plants. I know that's very true with Osha, which is a, which is a major plant for us, uh, that it's difficult to find it in the wild anymore. So again, um, something of, you know, that sustainability comes into play as well. Okay, next slide. Uh, oh, yes, this is a, a beauty product, <laughs> milkweed. Uh, in the old days, you know, uh, women would avidly gather milkweed because milkweed has sap, you know, it's, it has that milky sap. And they would gather that sap and they would put it on their face or on their skin. And this is especially good for wrinkles. And uh, so this was kind of the cosmetic of the day in those days, you know, where, where you would get milk sap. It tightens the skin, because when it dries, it, there's a tightening to the skin. And uh, it, it's also very uh, nutritious to the skin itself. So milkweed was used, you know, as a, as a kind of lotion. And um, I actually need some of that for the bags under my eyes. I should put some milkweed. But in any case, uh, milkweed uh, was used for that. Blue, trumpet, blue trumpets is a natural dye and a uh, beautiful plant when it's flowering. Uh, you can see it, especially in the high mountain meadows, you can see it for miles, you know, the blue trumpet as it comes out. So I'm going to finish up, I think, because I'm, our time is waning here uh, with maybe just two or three more slides. Okay. And this is called scorpion weed. Scorpion weed. Now, it's... Um, it was reputed to keep away scorpions and other venomous types of things, you know. That's why it's called scorpion. It also, and it also has a, a shape to, to its stem that looks like a, a scorpion's tail. But uh, this was actually used, you know, for treatment of uh, venomous bites. And that's another reason why it's, it's, it's called scorpion tail uh, weed. And um, it's kind of sticky. And... It, yeah, no, so it's kind of sticky, and, and it does adhere, you know, to wounds and to the skin and stays there long enough, you know, to have some effect on, on uh, the venom and, and uh, tightening the skin so the venom can be uh, extracted. And so um, I think I'll, I'll finish with this one. I, th I think, um, uh, didn't we cover this? I think we went to the bee bomb already. I think we saw bee bomb already. Yeah. Well, bee plant. Okay, so the bee balm is a little different. This is um, 
Uh, this is a form of oregano, wild oregano, okay? And so it's used in, in a lot of different uh, dishes that um, gives it that oregano taste, uh, but you can find it in the high mountains. Again, it's a plant very similar to that bee plant. And that's why I couldn't tell because it's right in the middle of this pillar. Uh, but um, it, it has similar qualities. This one is another plant that you can smell before you see it. Uh, and uh, again, bee balm. And I'll, I think I'll, I'll finish with this one. There's a lot of slides here, so uh, I don't want to uh, open it up for some questions. But uh, Jimson weed, of course, is uh, also called Datura. It blooms, um, during, um, blooms best during the full moon. And uh, it was used... Uh, essentially as uh, medicinally, it was used as a, um, uh, as a um, poultice. You can make a poultice out of either the leaves or the roots. It's very strong, you know, so that even if you come in contact with it, uh, it'll irritate your skin. And uh, the reason why it was used as a poultice is, is, you know, when you have a broken bone or you have a a sprained ankle, there's a lot of pain. And so this really actually worked as a, um, it numbed the nerves essentially in the skin and had a penetrating power all the way to, into the muscle itself. So this allowed really for uh, a lot of the, you know, treatments, especially when you're dealing with a broken bone or a sprained ankle or sprained, um, you know, muscle pain that this was really difficult, but you also had to endure the rash because it'll give you a rash. Uh, so it's, you know, you have to sort of balance, you know, do you want the rash or do you want the pain? And um, uh, remember that, that, that before doctors, you know, uh, people learned from each other. They had, to, they had to depend on each other. There were people, uh, usually grandmas or aunts, you know, that... Uh, paid attention to what kinds of plants could be used. They traded information a lot. I remember my grandmother visiting other grandmas, and lo and behold, some conversation would happen. Oh, so-and-so has this. Oh, well, they should use this and that. They should use this. Oh, I've heard this is good. You know, that's the way information got, got passed around in terms of how to use certain plants. And uh, I was lucky enough to to go with my grandmother and because I was the, the, the little burro, you know, I was the one who carried the plants and carried the boxes of things, you know, so she'd always take me out when she was picking. And, um, uh, and I'd have to carry the plants, so I had no choice but to learn them, you know, and uh, that's how I learned a lot of the, the uses. And in some cases, they're personal uses. They're not necessarily uses that someone else would tell you, but they're, they're, they're part of the folk tradition. Uh, of a place or even of a family. And in some cases, it's family knowledge that is being passed down or shared with each other. So, so those are the kinds of dynamics of, uh, you know, plant use in northern New Mexico that, and I tried to pick plants that were held in common with uh, Hispanic communities, Hispanic pr practitioners. I know a lot of our young people are really becoming very interested in reviving the... Um, the traditions of uh, healing, you know, and which plants are being used in a variety of different methods uh, um, and applied. Um, I know there's uh, there's a lot of uh, um, young uh, people that are trying to learn how to be midwives. Uh, others are trying to, to learn the whole herbal tradition. Uh, others are learning how to use those various uh, plants that I showed you, showed you for um, you know, traditional dyes and making traditional dyes for artwork. Uh, so there's a, there's a kind of um, renaissance, I think you, you would say, among some young people, you know, with regard to their knowledge and their wanting to know more about many of these plants. So I'm going to conclude my talk right there with Jimson Weed. I didn't mention that it's also a psychedelic, <laughs> okay, that it was used as a sacrament, sacramental plant that it induces um, vivid dreams and other things, but that it was used, you know, for those purposes of accessing. Um, and and I, I have to say that, you know, there are different levels of uses of these plants. So I've just given you some of the common uses of the plants. 
but there are also different and deeper levels of uses of the same plants, you know, that um, are part of the folk knowledge and folk traditions of certain families and uh, certain communities. So, um, so to access that knowledge, you have to be knowledgeable of your community <laughs> and of your community knowledge or of your family's knowledge. So that's what I would encourage young people to do, you know, is to really begin to pay attention. Because a lot of times I wasn't paying attention, okay? So um, I want to go play, I want to go swim, I want to, you know, eat rather than pick plants. And so uh, it's, it's a matter of being in the right place at the right time and really thinking about how important this knowledge is. And so I was lucky enough to have a grandma that just simply made me learn <laughs> whether I wanted to learn or not. And that's the way that that information many times gets passed in families, is through that, through that aunt or through that uncle, you know, that knows these plants and knows how to use them. So I'm open to questions about anything I've said so far in terms of the uh, presentation. Yeah, yeah, generally, uh, well, the flower generally is used uh, for the dyes. The leaves are used, you know, for the teas. And the roots generally are ground and used for salves. So, so there's, there's, there's different, and some plants you can use the plant in all of those different phases for different things, you see. You know, as a tea, as a dye, and also as a salve, yeah. But usually the roots, the roots were, were gathered and dried and then uh, pulverized or in some ways made into a powder, you know, and then uh, creating a salve out of, um, the, you know, the pinon that I showed you, it also has a, uh, a, 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 a kind of sap that is in and of itself very antiseptic, but this was commonly used in combination with some of these other plants that I showed you. And made into a salve uh, that was then used or could be stored and, and, and used as necessary. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of wound medicines, a lot of medicines that were used for wounds. Because people in, you know, in, in those times, they, they lived a hard life. They, and, and wounds were very common, you know, and so you had to be able to, to keep the wounds from getting infected and know how to do that. Ah. Two of them, one of them is land sport. Oh. And the other one is purse like that. Oh. And this noxious weed that yeah. is findable under municipal code is having black stockpile from the city of Albuquerque. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, well, some people's, yeah, some people's weeds are other people's medicines, right? And uh, both of the plants you mentioned are actually medicinal plants. And um, some of the reasons why I think some of the ordinances, you know, come up is that uh, they, are, uh, they are plants that uh, are very opportunistic. They're very rugged, and they're able to grow in many different kinds of places, you know, and so they're considered pests, okay? But uh, in reality, if, if you really understood uh, those plants, uh, they should be valued. Uh, purslane actually could be easily a cash crop if, if you develop the taste for it, you know, and, and, and certainly uh, that would be true of lamb's quarter. Lamb's quarter is extremely healthy. It's a healthy, a very nutritious plant. It was used in earlier times, you know, as uh, as we would use spinach. It was gathered, uh, you know, avidly wherever it grew. Uh, so yeah, th there are a lot of, um, you know, modern ordinances, modern biases that really mitigate against uh, our discovery uh, or rediscovery in some cases of the uses of these plants. 
But both of the plants that you, and I, the way you, you educate is you, you go forward and you educate the, the policy makers that these plants, you know, are indeed uh, nutritious. They're indeed used in folk medicines. And, um, you know, they need to take that into consideration when they're making those kinds of ordinances, yeah. Yes. Yes. So you're talking about sustainability, which I talk about in this book. Um, you're looking for that kind of plant, <laughs> you know. Uh, and and uh, so I, I have to say, I have to confess, I didn't know that. I didn't know that they were on the on the hit list, you know, of uh, weed plants for for these cities. Yes. Right, right. Well, that, that's, the, that's the key question, you know. It's really a shift of consciousness from kind of a, a modern consumer individualistic view, a very reductionist, you know, things have to have a purpose or they're not, they're not worth anything, you know, or at least in the mind of whoever is, is looking at it. It's, it's, it's a changing of consciousness. And I think you do that basically by educating people by actually creating a context in which they can learn about these plants, they can learn about the cultural traditions of place. And, um, and those courses have always been, the, in my time, they were, they were uh, very avidly sought after and they still are, I think, of interest to lots of people. But the key thing is really that consciousness that has to shift. And the only way to do that, I think, is through an education process that allows them to really understand uh, what the meaning of these plants are culturally, historically. Uh, that's why I gave you that contexting, you know, because uh, in, that, in that Pueblo viewpoint, you know, all of these plants have a place and have, a, have an importance. And it's, it's our responsibility to, first of all, learn about that, but secondly, to also preserve them. Because in preserving them, we're also preserving that, that place. Uh, because every plant is connected in, in this web of life that we are now discovering we're destroying, you know, uh, with our modern way of life. And so uh, it, it's a matter of creating that consciousness. And that's really what sustainability science is beginning to build on, you know, is, is this idea of um, how do we preserve ourselves and sustaining ourselves as we sustain the natural world simultaneously. And of course, our traditions were doing that at one time, you know, in very, very elegant ways. And uh, so it, then that brings up cultural knowledge, cultural traditions that have to be reflected on, have to be studied, have to be read about and have to be taught about. Now, as it turns out, a lot of this has actually been going on, but outside the institutions, <laughs> okay? Generally outside the institutions. And, um, and I think institutions have to examine that positioning, you know, with regard to what kinds of courses uh, they, they bring forward, especially now as we're looking at sustainability once again, particularly sustainability here in this, in this region. What are the important things? And this is going back to looking back at your history. That's that trail that you've come on. Uh, understanding the reality of the present time and what is needed at the present time. And looking out into the future to see where you, where you can actually bring forward some of this new knowledge, which is really old knowledge. So the, so the new knowledge, of course, any of these plants from a bio, biological, uh, ecological standpoint can be studied with Western science but simultaneously studying it with the cultural views, cultural understandings enhances your understanding of uh, those plants and gives you a new lens 
I, that I think is much richer than just simply studying them as, um, as academic biological specimens, okay? Big difference between studying a plant that way and studying it within its cultural context, its historical context. And I think that's what's missing. Uh, I know that's what's missing in many times in the study of plants, because I went through uh, a system that, that didn't include that. And uh, I had to include that through my own experience and through my own research. But it shouldn't have to be that way. You know, you have to, you have to create integrated courses that allow for that kind of coverage that is more comprehensive. Yes? Yes, absolutely. That's part and parcel. That's the action-oriented uh, aspect of native science. Native science is the ways in which uh, uh, native peoples have gathered knowledge and understanding and insight about the places in which they live, about the plants, the animals, um, the uh, the environment, the weather, the cosmos, you know, in the places in which they live. So it's a very place-based science. It is the most ancient form of science and probably one of the most ancient forms of expressions of that science is plant knowledge because we find examples of uh, plants being um, uh, you know, in burial sites of uh, Paleolithic uh, peoples uh, all the way back to 70,000 years ago. You, you know, they found um, plant remains that are basically medicinal that are interred with uh, burial sites, of bur people that were being buried at that time. So we, knew, we know they knew quite a bit about their, those plants and that it was, it was a, already a formed kind of body of knowledge. And so native science really is nothing more than uh, the history of that, of that process, of how native peoples or indigenous peoples or any peoples actually have come to know what they know about the places in which they live and have internalized that and expressed that in their cultures, in their traditions, in their song, in their dances, and in their way of viewing life. And also, native science is based on a, a different worldview of, than um, contemporary modern society. That is that, that everything is related, that we're related to everything, that uh, we have a responsibility uh, to perpetuate life uh, because that life also perpetuates us. And so there's a mutual reciprocal uh, action and process in play. So all of those become, you know, an example of native science, you know. But it's essentially traditional knowledge, you know. It's, it's knowledge of cultures and traditions. And we have to begin to tap into that, I think, as we begin to um, explore a new way of living with the earth and living with each other, you know. So I should say native science is also um, very connected to native community. So the, the idea of community and the idea of the science or the the explanation of aspects of the natural world go hand in hand in, in native thought. Yes? Yes. 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 Right. It is an institution, right? Yeah. And it's vetted. It's a vetted institutional process, deeply embedded, you know, in, in that Western worldview. So, so I, I think part of the challenge is, is how do we change that vestedness and that worldview in a way that allows it to begin to really explore these other parameters? And, and that's the big question of higher education today because, you know, the, the question is out there, is, is higher education relevant anymore because of our technologies of Zoom and, and the ability to access information almost at any level if we have the right tools to do that, you know? And um, 
So we have to begin to think about the, the, the viability and sustainability of higher ed, you know, in, in face of those kinds of uh, questions and challenges, which are there. And they're being presented by the students who are participating in and the participants in higher education as a whole as well. So we'll have that discussion, I think, uh, tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. So Right. Right. Uh-huh. Intrigued. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I see it happening. I see it happening more and more uh, that uh, especially young people, uh, they're studying, let's say, plant ecology like I used to. And then they're, they, they get uh, uh, a perspective like that from some kind of situation where they actually see how effective herbs and certain kinds of situations are more effective than the drugs that uh, are used, you know, to cure that. And, uh, it, it, you know, for, for a blister like that, a large blister, it was probably a combination of um, uh, pinyon sap, osha, and uh, a plant called calendula, which is often used to, um, to as, as, a, as a drawing sap, it draws and dries up the, uh, the blister and, and then heals the skin at the same time. So it was probably a combination somewhat of that. But there may be, you know, and I have to say also that because this is based on experience, that, that there are a lot of families and there are a lot of individuals who, through their own experience, have experienced the use of a, a particular plan in a certain way that is very effective, but they haven't necessarily shared it in a, with others or, with, or it's not published or it's in some... In, in, in someone's mind, but it's but it's there and it's it's effective, but it hasn't been studied, you know. So the time when that happens, I hope, is soon. <laughs> I think we need everything and every source of knowledge we have, you know, as we move forward, as we begin to try to rediscover what it is to sustain ourselves in a place. And uh, I hope that herbology becomes. Uh, it is. It is already from the time I I, I began to explore herbology. You know, which was when I was uh, here at uh, when I was at Highlands. Um, you know, the field of herbology has grown tremendously. I mean, you can find uh, you know Ayurveda, which is um, the um, uh, East Indian uh, system, uh, one of the most ancient systems of plant use as food and medicine. Is, is coming back big time. Uh, Chinese herbology and acupuncture is also coming back uh, extensively studied, you know. So, so the same thing is true with herbology. And there is a scientific study of herbology that is going on among some herbologists where they actually have documented how these plants work in certain kinds of conditions, uh, really beginning to look at how to prepare them, the dosages, all the different kinds of things that one would do to um, to, to 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 make um, uh, how should I say to to um, well, I guess you would say to legitimize the uses of herbs in a Western 
context. <laughs> okay, but this, this, this is knowledge that, you know, communities have always had. They, they, didn't, they didn't, you know, run and look it up in a, in a, in a neurobiology book. You know, they were, they were doing it as a, as a matter of practice and experience. So, so to, to answer your question, it, you know, alternative health is, big, is becoming big time too. And so, uh, and unfortunately expensive. Unfortunately expensive as well, but, um, but it's also knowledge you can gain and you can use on your own if you take the time to research it, to, to understand it, and to, to use it, to apply it, as, you, as your uncle did. <laughs> Okay, I think we're ready for some food, right? Uh, I should say that I have a few books here. You wanna take a look at um, these books that I have out are actually for sale. So there, are, um, if you wanna come and look at one and like to, to purchase one, just see me. Uh, but I'll just leave them up here for you to look at if you wish. Uh, I don't wanna... So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Like uh, Dr. Linder indicated, uh, join us with, for some refreshments and uh, maybe one-on-one uh, -on -one questions with uh, Dr. Cajete. Thank you all very much for being here. We really appreciate it.